Welcome to the Wander Learn podcast. This is Francis Tapon. I am here with Mark Joseph and Ariel Jonathan Arias Fernandez. Is that I pronounce that correctly? Good. good. That's good. good. Yeah. Yeah, Francis. And tell me, guys, where you are right now? Uh, we are in Cochabamba, Bolivia. Bolivia, one of the countries I haven't been to in South America. I'm very jealous. Um, <laughs> and both of you kind of met through a near fatal car accident that kind of brought you together and you guys are both cousins and eventually yes. led you to El Camino de Santiago uh, de Compostela, which is the long route that goes across northern Spain and eventually made you produce a documentary, which you're going to be launching a Kickstarter. This is a lot that we want to cover, talk about. So I want to focus on El Camino de Santiago, but let's first talk a little bit about your background and how you guys as cousins met. Introduce yourselves. Mark, I'll start with you. Uh, yes. Um, so I, um, uh, I had an accident, uh, in April of uh, 2015, uh, near fatal accident. And, uh, that accident basically went and did, uh, some pretty severe damage to a foot, which caused me to learn how to have to walk again. What? Sorry. Uh, it was, also, this was an auto automobile accident. Yes. And where was it? Yes. Uh, it was uh, heading South, uh, on a highway in Indiana. And uh, there was a young man driving north who ended up having um, a seizure while driving. Sorry, this was in Bolivia. Uh, no, no, this was in Indiana. Oh, Indiana. Okay, I didn't hear that. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes, yes, it's Indiana. And uh, he ended up crossing lanes into the southbound lane. I was coming out of a business meeting um, with a client. And uh, we basically, close to, to, to full throttle, went nose to nose. And we both survived, thank God. Uh, what speed, um, approximately? Uh, I think by the time we were breaking down, we were probably around the uh, 50 mile an hour mark. Okay, good. But still, we we're probably traveling around 65, 70 on either side. Uh, he had no, I mean, he had slowed down. He had no really uh, control because he was in the middle uh, of having a seizure, having an attack. Um, but uh, he had crossed lanes and, and we impacted. Uh, we hit each other. Um, so, um, you know, I both taken away uh, by ambulance, well, him by a helicopter and me by an ambulance. Was he injured and much worse than you? I'd say pretty much uh, on, on the same level Okay. Uh, as far as recovery. And, and he was in the hospital a little bit longer to recover. Um, but uh, at the same time, I had to go through a series of surgeries to uh, reconstruct my foot and uh, also uh, a section here on, on my face. Uh, but we made it through. Um, and you're still looking handsome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Appreciate that. I have my days. I don't know. <laughs> For those who are just listening to this on the podcast, uh, we're also filming this uh, video as well on uh, YouTube. So you can watch the video there as well. But continue, Mark. Okay. So then what happened? So, you know, following uh, this incident, um, you know, I knew I was going to be going through a series of surgeries. Uh, and I had just uh, started a couple of years back a fledgling uh, marketing and design company. I'm a graphic designer by trade. And um, so knowing that there would be this process of surgeries and trying to maintain business, it kind of put me into a little bit of, 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 of I was going down in, in, in to a depression. Mm. And because um, I knew that somehow, some way, there would have to be a start again uh, to this. And then uh, I remembered a, um, a television show that I had seen with um, Rick Steves when I was younger um, uh, about the Camino Santiago. And it was, you know, I was just thinking about what do I do next, what do I do next. And this is something I was planning on doing with maybe my kids or something like that later on. But um, that kind of caused me into taking a look at this as a possible place to create as a victory mark and a victory walk for getting to the point where I can walk again. Um, Hold on. So I, Jonathan, can you describe the moment that Mark contacted you about this crazy idea he had? Yeah, sure. You know, like he was telling you, he's part of the family. I mean, he's part of my, my wife's family. Um, one day we were uh, having some time with my father-in-law and Abuelita and Abuelito, you know, grandma, grandpa. Uh, so he was there, he was there at home and he arrived from, I don't know how long, 
he arrived to the house after, I don't know, like many years. And about 20 I, years it depends since I've been in Bulgaria. Yeah, so it was a lot. He was not there in that I didn't, particular I didn't know house, that. you know, and that house is really um, significant for the family working yeah. because it was the house where everyone had some nice moments when they were child and all that. So it, it's really important house. And that's uh, the abuelita or abuelito. Uh, you're going to find abuelita there. You get my point. So, I mean, I was there because I love a lot that family. So, um, we were sharing something. I don't know if it was a birthday uh, reunion or something. And he got there and it was like, who the hell are you, man? <laughs> I don't know you. Uh, I know this family, but I don't know you. So, uh, I already knew his father. Uh, Jaime, mm. and we spent some time with him and Barbara, his mom, and she's so so nice, so kind, and she was like, oh, trying to speak in Spanish, and she was really kind with me. So I got really, really close to to this part of the family, and he started talking about uh, his father and how he was feeling and, and all that, and he told me, I'm thinking about doing this walking, and... I knew something about this. Okay, so had you this. heard about the El Camino de Santiago at that point, Mark? I mean, uh, Jonathan? Okay, you had no, you yeah, knew about it. You knew, something it. You knew about, about it. it. Yeah, I knew about it. But you've but never been to like, Spain. Yeah, no, I've never been there. Uh, and, and it was like, uh, oh, the trip, to, I said, that's really interesting for me. But I didn't. we didn't talk about the project, about mm -hmm. the documentary film, or about a movie, nothing. It was just, oh... We're getting to know each other. Yeah, we were, we were starting knowing to each other. And he told me, okay, so maybe I'm going to do this walking. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, that's so interesting. But okay, so it was nothing more than that. And then he started asking about uh, what I was doing. And I also had an accident. It was not that bad, but I had um, like, I don't know, almost two years without working. Uh, my my arms were broken, and my hand. I mean, it was really really not nice. But anyway, it was not that uh, hard. But those ones for me were really really difficult also. So he told me about my my job, and I was telling him that I was doing some documentary films and another recordings for uh, some other people. I, mean, I was uh, working on production at the time, and I'm still doing that. And uh, I don't know if he thought about that. I really don't know what he thought at the moment. But he told me, oh, would you do something like this? But that was afterwards, not that moment. But right? another day we after, no. each other. It would be afterwards. He called me and he told me, I'm thinking about doing this. And I said, okay. And could you get together, have coffee or something like that? Okay. So I went like to hear him out. You know, I used to... Uh, share coffees with everyone, like, hey, when we're going to have coffee time? Okay, coffee time. For me, the coffee time means that I'm going to hear somebody's issues. You get my point? Yeah. I say, okay, yeah. he's my ear. That's it. You talk, I'm going to hear. That's it. I'm not going to do anything, but I'm going to hear you. And what year was this, that by the way? Was this in 2016? 16. 16, yeah. Okay. It was 2016. Spring of 16. Yeah. So he it's made you an offer that you couldn't refuse, basically. He said, hey, let's go shoot this documentary together. Let's walk El Camino de Santiago. And he said, I'm not going to just finish in Compostela. Compostela, for those who don't know, is the kind of the official ending point. But you did the extra version. You went to Murcia. There's two uh, points in El Camino that extend a bit beyond about, I think, about an extra 80, 90 kilometers extra. Uh, which is adds about two, three days, four days, depending on your pace, um, to your journey. And how long did it take you? Where did you start El Camino de Santiago? And where did, I mean, I know you ended in Murcia. Murcia is M-U-X-I-A. Um, and it's the uh, right by the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. But where did you actually yeah, start your journey, Mark? Uh, we began the journey uh, in Saint Jean Pied de Port okay. on the French side. I'm okay. probably saying that wrong, and French people would I, not like the way we're saying it. Let me, let me, since I'm half French, Saint Jean, Saint Jean Pied du Port. <laughs> there you go. That, that place. <laughs> and then you went to Roncesvalles. No, I don't know. 
Sanjong. We started in Sanjong, and uh, which is you know through my research the traditional starting point. Um, and yeah. actually, you know, the, with yeah. the show that was done by Rick Steves, that's where he started his little show um, that he had done. Um, now, we went ahead in that first day, we crossed the, uh, went through the Pyrenees uh, into the Basque area. And, um, you know, that's a big uh, uphill just, climb, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it, it, it was. But I was uh, full of a lot of, uh, full of a lot of adrenaline. Um, it wasn't as hard. Uh, I, and, like, and, and your foot do was doing of, okay, I guess. Uh, it hurt, um, uh, but from day uh, one, I, Pat, it, there, there's there was always swelling involved, and I had to put a lot of. Uh, there's a topical medication that you can put on it to keep the pain. How many kilometers did you do per day, Mark, uh, with that foot injury that you still hadn't been fully recovered? Obviously. Um, my full recovered was just because I needed more training. And I think what they say with the Camino is that when you first do your first section, though, you get your walking legs. For me, it was kind of my walking foot okay. included into that. Right. Um, and I I think the first leg, if you're going to be doing the, the I think that's called the Napoleonic route, when you go over, uh, up and over, uh, it, it's about 15 kilometers, but it's up. So uh, that was quite a break in for me. Mm with uh, both uh, ibuprofen and, uh, and the diclofenac on my foot at the same time. Yeah, I mean, but I made it through. That's the thing about El Camino for, for those who start at Saint-Jean-Pied-du-Port. Saint -Jean it's hard because you're out of shape. I mean, relatively, most people are kind of out of shape when they start, and it's the hardest part of the entire trail, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just like, it's, a, but, it's uh, baptism was, by fire. Exactly. It is. Yeah, and I would say it's more than 20 kilometers. Actually, when you see the map, when you start, they give you a map and, I don't know, something that's going to help you to go through. So it's more than 25 kilometers, actually, the first day, yeah. yes. Because you have to go up the hill yeah. and then go down until Ronces Valles, right? Yeah. So that's the place you should end up that day. Right. The first day, that should right. be your first day. And yes. that's kind of like 28 or 25 kilometers. So assuming that you're gonna go up this big hill is really so it's they, really they don't have it's they so don't have a single place to sleep at the top of the mountain no uh you can stop at they have one location called Orison. okay so, uh, right before the uh the version of Orison. because the people who do el camino santiago who are in their 80s you know, they're incredibly old people who are who are or other people who are just out of shape uh who are doing it right right and and you know sometimes people are having to be taken down. I mean, yeah. it's paved enough just yeah. because it's such a hard route that first day. Yeah. It's yeah. paved uh, in some sections so that you can go ahead and, and if they need to call somebody and bring you back down, they'll, they'll bring you back down. Um, but for the the most part, um, you have Orison, which you can stop as a midway point. And if you're elderly or you're having physical problems, you can at least, you know, stay there in, in the Alberga there for one or two days. Yeah. Um, and then continue on over, you know. Yeah. Okay, so, so they, they, they tell us it. a little bit about, it took about a month, would you say, to get to Murcia, or a little bit more? Um, we can go into that a little bit in the interview, but I think we actually got done in um, about 27 or 29 days, okay. and that was because I was pushing okay. so hard. Okay, great. I was, there was, okay. everybody goes through their reason while walking. Mine, there was a lot of steam coming out of my ears. Well, okay. And this is the thing that a lot of people, I mean, what I love about long trails, and I've done many, is that it's a time to reflect on your life. And I think for some people who do El Camino Santiago, what would you say is the percentage of people do you think that were doing it for religious reasons uh, versus, let's say, spiritual or other reasons, you know, who are a classic, you know, real, strong, hardcore Christian? What percentage would you say? Okay, yeah. So there's a lot of people, maybe about half of the people, who are doing El Camino Santiago, which was a pilgrimage, a Christian pilgrimage, or is, a pilgrimage. and yet they're not, yeah. they're not doing it for Christianity. They're doing it for other reasons. Um, but for, tell us a little about why your particular reason, what motivated you? Was it religion, Mark? Um, I think it, it was both a combination of uh, personal hurts. Uh, it was religion uh, or faith-based. Uh, I kind of view religion, even though I'm a practicing Catholic, I view religion and your spirituality within it as two different things. Um, 
Uh, and I was also doing it because I wanted to come to terms with um, some of the things that were revealed to me about my dad and um, my own issues with forgiveness and um, my own, uh, that also stemming into anger. And um, I think I guess finally out of it is just to try and, and, and find the answers you know, to, to the whys and, and walking with him, I walked with his ashes. So yeah, uh, for me, that was, it was what I call now um, a, uh, a walk of devotion. It was a devotional walk because it wasn't just me. I was trying to do it for us. And pardon me if I, I know the cry baby amongst our communal family. <laughs> <laughs> so if I get a little choked up during the, during the interview, please, I apologize. Yeah, no, no problems. I mean, this is, it is an emo a very emotional journey for sure. I mean, whether you're, whatever the reason you're doing it, it pushes you to the limit. Uh, how was it f um, for you, Jonathan, uh, that uh, how were you kind of affected by the trail itself? Look, I would divide myself in two pieces because like I was telling you before, I was like hired to do this job. You know, it's like, OK, you are a filmmaker or whatever. You have an idea. We are going to take an extra guy to record this with a camera, but it wasn't enough to make a recording like if we were really making a movie, you get it? I mean, like this the is way, why, if for those who have seen the movie, the way there, you have a huge crew. Yeah. I mean, you would need a crew with this. It was Mark, Alberto, that it was the camera guy and me right. that actually I was making a lot of filmmaking also, I mean, footage. Right because the guy was not, um, uh, he's not a bad guy, but it was like, sometimes he was really tired, you know? And it was like, okay, he's really tired. So, okay, I understand, man. I totally understand you, but we need to do this. Let me your camera, I'm gonna do this. Mm. So sometimes he was like, I cannot do this. And he's a really good guy. Did you have you uh, know, two cameras? Just one. Oh, just one camera. Just okay, one. Got it. Okay. Yeah, well, because sense. of, it yeah. was really heavy, yeah, you know, after this, no, but I thought that maybe you could shoot some B-roll with a small, small camera, even if it's a phone camera. Some phones shoot in 4K video. Yes, yeah. yes, but it was like we needed to have this footage in a really uh, good um, format. Yeah, format, and you know. I understand. So, well, this is one side. I had to record. I had to um, record him walking, struggling, uh, sharing with people. It was like my, my main uh, motivation being there. But of course, you cannot put apart your uh, body issues, uh, your hurt, your pain, uh, your own process inside. Because I was struggling with my, my father's cancer also. You gave me that moment. Uh, I realized my father was with cancer and I was really touched by that. And, and I said, okay, I cannot put this, in, this uh, thing in this job. I have to be uh, professional enough to record and that's it. But you cannot do that. I mean, this is the other part of myself uh, that I was going on also. Mark, so I was, tell me. There were moments, Mark, really. Mark, tell me a little bit about some of the logistical challenges you had for filming this and just doing it uh, as a documentary. And, and you're, you're trying to get into your own journey and at the same time distracted by the practical reality. And people, you know, can't underestimate how much time it takes to do these things. I, I've done it myself, so I know what I'm talking right. about. But go ahead and right. explain a little bit. Well, you know, I think, I think the, um, one of the, the, the things for me that was a challenge is that there was no... Um, it, it's getting used to having cameras be there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the, the, the ultimate reason on why I wanted to record this, and we can even go into the reasons why later, is, um, you know, I, I needed a, a sense of, of a memory. Most people have journals, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, for me, uh, just being an artist, being from the business, there, there was the why is why we were doing it, which we I kind of didn't know why. I just knew that I had to. Yes. And so the logistically, it was hard to, for me, um, get used to having cameras around. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a little hard to, um, 
you know, crying in, in, in front of a camera. Right. Um, right. You know, uh, and, and show, you know, raw emotion. Um, because, you know, eventually people are going to see this. But um, I always told myself they're seeing the point of a person in their life. They can't look at one person going through these things like, oh, this encapsulates the whole entire person. It is. It was for me a critical pivot point that it was for me uh, on this walk, and I'm just glad we did it. But that was the hardest hardest thing logistically for me was just uh, knowing that because it, it wasn't performance, but knowing that I could be as as raw when I needed to be and, and not be afraid of the cameras. And within within time, that did happen. And and of course, you I should add there. I'm sorry, and I should add that it was. It was so hard because you were talking about logistics. It was so hard that we fought many times. Of I mean, course. It was of like, course. hey man, why in the hell I'm here? Right. You get my point? Right. So what's the story? Days, what's the story? Two or three days without seeing him. And it was in the phone like, hey man, where are you? I'm struggling with my own issues. I know, but I need to record you, man. So <laughs> where are you? <laughs> I'll see you afterward, Jim. Bye. So I was like two days. So Mark, uh, you went off into the woods, or where did you disappear to? Well, they, it, this is this was actually was recommended uh, to me by somebody who walked the Camino uh, and uh, actually had uh, himself recorded through his process. Is that the only way that there is a process that exists is if you have your um, alone time and don't have uh, the cameras on you. And so it was recommended to me by him to be able to create to what we call the jump, where uh, John, uh, Jonathan, and Alberto, they went ahead and uh, did a jump. Um, and so during those times, it allowed me to go through and experience some of the things uh, that I needed to, which allowed me to, once the cameras were in front of me again, um, to be able to expose myself. So sorry, but Mark, were you walking ahead or did you walk off the trail? I walked ahead. Okay, got it. Okay, so I you just kind of like steamrolled ahead and they couldn't catch up to you because they were lugged down by their cameras and all their gear. They, they would they would walk back, literally walk back, or they would jump back for some B-roll and then they would uh, come back forward and meet with me uh, two or three days later. Okay, got it. And then we would okay, be okay. all together again. Okay. But, you know, I think when they were walking, they did backwards. I think they may have walked a little bit more than Mushi itself. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> they, did have, they did have the trains, they did help, but a lot. they did a lot of extra walking. And that made it really interesting because it was those, those moments we were not together. It was like, okay, so that made me realize this was real. Mm. So that's what we're trying to tell through this story. This is not something like we went, and okay, camera, action, that's it. I mean, it was like, man, we are living this process with this guy. Mm. And we are living the same process, maybe in another situation or moment internally talking, right? But this is the good thing about this uh, documentary film, I think. It is honest, I mean, we tried to keep it honest because sometimes it was like, hey, I got this issue or I got this problem. You were not there to film this. And I said, I know, but uh, still good because that's the reality. I mean, that's what we are living. So that's what we are going to be able to tell me. Maybe I'm not going to see you uh, in pain or whatever, but I'm going to ask you and you're going to have to tell me in an interview, let's say. And, while we are in the Camino, we're going to have to tell me this and I'm going to have to believe you. If you, Get my point, I mean, if you guys had to do it, real. hold on. If you guys had to do it all over again, what would you do differently? Um, I, I have, a, I think that, you know, a lot of times, and I think, first of all, because it's documentary, because it's, it's, it's in essence, real life, um, there, it, it's not contained like a movie or a film. Um, you know, we were tight on budget and I think what I would have done is I would have not been afraid and spent the extra money on some extra equipment so that it would make John's life a lot easier. For example, uh, like what equipment? Some camera like shaking. What? Having a gable instead of the camera shaking. Mm -hmm. Got it. These types of things. Yeah. So because people go, you know, people, I guess in the filmmaking industry, because they're around technology, will go, oh gosh, look at that camera shake. That's, oh, you know, there, there seems to be some streaming off of the imagery. And, but at the same time, it's, it's, it's a documentary. And uh, documentaries, I mean, people do them on cell phones now. I mean, 
it's okay to be imperfect because it's a documentary. Right. But because of, you know, I think both of our perfectionist nature when it comes to producing something, um, it's, it's, it's kind of like, God, why, why was I afraid? Why was I afraid of it? You know? Right. And that's what we only have to do different. What advice would you give somebody who's watching or listening to this uh, and they're thinking about doing El Camino de Santiago? What would advice would you give them? You go ahead and then I'll give my take. Um, you're talking about just doing the Camino, but not filming or recording Correct. or something yeah, like that? Right. Yeah, Correct. Most people are yeah that's right. Film, yeah, so most people are not going to film. Average person who wants yeah, to go off and Something do. I heard. And I would apply, and I would, and I would tell them to apply. Is realize that this is going to be hard. First, you have to know this is going to be hard, and live day by day. That's the only thing I would tell them. You know, because when you think, okay, I'm going to prepare my body, and I'm going to train, and I'm going to do this, and never is going to be enough. I can't show you that never is going to be enough. You're not going to be prepared here to do the Camino. So you have to prepare here every single day. When you're going to start, you have to think that you're going to have that day to walk. And that's it. Next day, you don't know. You wait. So I would say live day by day. That's it. That's all. What say. about you, Mark? You know, and um, there are actually uh, two different things. The first is if you're going to do the Camino, uh, do it for your own reasons um, and do your best to prepare yourself to be clean of anybody else's expectations. Um, I think that um, for every person, it's, it, it, it is such a personal walk. For me, you know, there, there was criticism um, by somebody online once to me uh, of, you know, why are you walking with the camera? You're not going to have your authentic communal. Um, I, just because of the core of who I am as an artist, uh, I needed to have that, I think, my memory for myself. Uh, but at the same time, there's a side of me that said, yeah, I wonder what it would, what it would have been like to do it alone. But at that time, I was so uh, raw that um, I thank God that, you know, that there was, there was family there. Um, I think the the second thing is, um, you know, like John said, you, you can't really prepare uh, yourself for the Camino. Um, I think with all the books that are out there, they do help a little bit, but you do have to live the day by day, uh, and you have to go uh, at your own pace. And don't if if you're needing to keep up with people, ask yourself why do you need to keep up with people? Because you're there for yourself. And if it's time for them to move on at their pace, it's time for them to move on at their pace. But what if you're going with somebody as a partner from the get-go? You know, let's say you're going with your spouse. I think that there are times where um, if you want, it, it depends on the couple. Mm -hmm. there's, there, there's no set answer. And that's the one thing about the Camino is, or even about documentaries is that um, there's there's no set answer. You have to ask each other why you're both there. Mm -hmm. And if one gets tired, um, is it okay for them to go that extra mile and say, I will meet up with you a couple of days later if, if you care for them enough to say, I still want you to keep moving. And then the other one may completely refuse and say, there's absolutely no way I'm not gonna leave you behind. Um, so it's it's personal for them. Speaking about personal, Mark, Tell us how, how and when did your father die? Um, uh, my accident was in early April. He died less than 90 days later. Um, he died from uh, kidney cancer. They had performed surgery. They did not get all of uh, the cancer. And he developed pneumonia. And pneumonia and complications with cancer, it somehow it, it, it progressed it so quickly that he died within around. Uh, Were you there days. by his bedside when he died? Yeah, I was. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, now you, you had, had a, me that you don't need to talk. <laughs> talk about that. You had, you had a, okay. Um, you had sure. Um, and if I'm breaking down a little bit, that's why I have my rep. Uh, you know, um, my father moved from Bolivia to the United States uh, in the '50s uh, to create a new life for himself. Um, he was young. He was 21 years old, and he had that opportunity. Uh, he was actually helped. Um, by one of his older brothers, which is uh, uh, 
Jonathan's not his father-in-law, but his father-in-law's father. Um, and, you know, I, I think that the reasons for him leaving also had to do with um, his experiences. Uh, my grandfather was an alcoholic. He used to, my dad's dad, he used to uh, beat um, uh, my grandmother. Uh, and um, basically, uh, there was times where just for the safety of my dad, uh, you know, caught in between this and also the other brothers having to help defend uh, the grandmother from the, my grandfather. Um, they said, let's go ahead and at least try and reset his life and, and get him out. And so my uncle um, actually helped, uh, helped him pay to get to the United States to go to school. And um, he reestablished his life there. But those pains um, that he had uh, towards my grandfather really came out in his, in, in, while he was passing. Now, um, but your relationship with your father wasn't that great. Either. I mean, you had problems. Um, the problems weren't the relationship. I think the problems came from the pain uh, of his relationships. He never beat me. Uh, he never hurt me. He would yell. Uh, he would have expectations. He would criticize. But, um, you know, there, there was ways that he, I think, far surpassed his circumstances uh, of, of what he lived in as, as a child. Um, but I recognize now that a lot of those things also, he didn't have a chance to grow uh, as well. And um, so, you know, I think his reactions towards other people, I think you learn from your parents. And this is the thing that is passed on. This is part of those generational wounds that you, you know, pass on to a child, if he sees you yelling, if he sees you angry, if he sees you upset for days over somebody that may have done something wrong to him, you learn that this is the way to be. And then you take that into your relationships and you can take that into uh, to your children. And so the generational wound doesn't have to be the beatings or, or abuse or anything like that, even though he experienced it. Gen generational wounds can also come to the way you're taught and how you can even pass that anger or pass that unforgiveness and take it to the next level so and, and take it down the journey. Would you say, Mark, uh, part of the purpose of going on this El Camino de Santiago, this transformative journey, which I'm a big believer in, in when you're going through these things, if you want to get over some issue in your life, taking a long walk is actually a fantastic way of doing that. So was part yeah. of the purpose of doing El Camino de Santiago for you, Mark, was to get over your generational wound, or at least to heal this generational wound, as you say? To heal it as much as I could. I think there's expectations that people want you to be fixed when you come back. Um, but um, and this is where I said, you know, the expectation should be you walk it, you walk it for yourself. Um, but it was for me, not only mine, um, but also um, some things, uh, one of my child, one of my children in particular are going through and have been going through ever since the community two years ago that uh, I really had to make a decision for myself on how to um, work with this child and support them in their process, in their processes, you know, uh, uh, things that maybe my dad didn't know how to do that I had to come to terms, even if I knew it was going to be hard and, and it is still hard to this day, but that will also be revealed in the documentary. Did your dad, so, did your dad want to be cremated? Uh, yes. Okay. He did. okay. And then tell us about your decision to take his ashes with you through El Camino Santiago. Um, um, on a spiritual level, uh, you know, I do believe that there, there was, I think, a personal meaning for him being able to walk with me. Uh, I believed through the process, and I believe, because again, people will doubt it, that spiritually he was with me through, through a number of the processes that I had gone through. Um, but at the same time, um, I knew that it was um, therapeutic uh, for me in my heart that I'm actually physically in some manner of way walking with my dad. Um, and the, the things that happened at his bedside when he was dying um, galvanized 
my reason from not only walking as a victory walk from getting over an accident, but that there was something deeper um, to be able to have to walk for and something more devotional uh, to have to walk for, for him and for me, especially with what, um, especially with what he went through when he was done. Now, tell us a little bit about the process now that you're going to be doing this Kickstarter that you're going to be launching. Have you, sure. uh, you haven't cut the, you haven't done the final cut of the film right now. You're going to be raising, how much money are you trying to raise uh, to complete the film? Because you got all the footage, almost all the footage, I imagine. We have most of the footage. We have about 90% of the footage. Right. Um, we still have to go through a predominant amount of it is going to be used for post editing. Obviously, a portion of it's going to be used for incentives to give people what I think are going to be, you know, valuable uh, incentives. Sorry, uh, uh, how much are you tr going to be aiming to raise? Uh, $65,000. Okay, and it's an, it's an all or nothing thing. Yes, it's, an, it's going to be an all or nothing thing. So yes. if you raise $40,000, you get nothing. Correct. Okay, so when people pledge Correct. on Kickstarter, just be aware of that, that whatever you end up pledging, you may not be charged the dime if if Mark is not able to raise the 60,000. And so I imagine the bulk of that, maybe what, 70%? What percentage is going to- The bulk of it is going to be going, going towards um, uh, final B-roll and getting over there, doing the B-roll editing uh, and all the post-production with sound, everything that needs to make it to the quality of what people expect today when it comes to documentary films. Right. And uh, right. Part, of, part of it, Go ahead. No, go ahead. Continue. Uh, part of it, obviously, is to pay towards uh, incentives and then uh, pay towards people that are uh, involved in helping marketing it and those those types of things. And then once the film is cut, what is your timeline of when you want to release it? Sometime uh, November 2019, maybe? Uh, no, <laughs> um, we're, 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 uh, I'm working with uh, a gentleman who um, uh, deals with production out of California, and he says expectations should be uh, anytime in April of 2019. He said with the amount of footage that we have to be able to work with, um, it, he says we need to lineate this. I know what expectations I have as far as the story that needs to be told, uh, but we need to lineate it and pull in enough of the... Um, any of the extra interviews or things that need to be done to be able to tighten this up so that once it's uh, cut and ready to go out the door, that it is going to be something that is going to be relevant and meaningful for people who are either dealing with generational wounds uh, or are considering walking the Camino of Santiago and uh, another point of view to take from doing the Camino. So um, I think the one thing that does need that does need to be said is, is when we went into... Producing this film, um, John, you know, just being the, the director that he is, is is like, you know, why am I here? <laughs> he said, why am I here? And I would look at him and say, I don't know. Let's just film and see what happens. You know, because it's, you know, life and, and, and documentaries is, is kind of like, how do you delineate that? What's the final goal of the story? I felt a call to go on this walk. I felt a call to go with my father. We brought cameras along to record it for me as an artist and wanting to do something. To, I guess to be artistically relevant during this time of my life. Because my dad always pushed me to follow what was in my heart. You know, he said, your heart first. So I didn't know. I think that confused John a lot. But as things have evolved, things have come together in, 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 in a pretty terrific way. What happens if you don't raise the 60000 you only raise 20000 and the whole thing? Is there a plan B? I don't, okay. <laughs> no, I don't want to think about that. I don't want to think about that. And speaking of that, that I mean, do, do you, you think people are clipping from the internet? Maybe, but I don't want to do it that okay. way. I mean, you, you can, you can tell the story like, little by Because when people are thinking about doing El Camino Santiago, for example, it's another big project, kind of like doing a documentary. In a sense, you're doing two big projects. One is walking it, and then the second thing is doing this film. For most people, they're just doing yeah. El Camino. And is right. it good to have a plan B when you're walking a Camino? Like, what if I don't get to Compostela? What if I don't, what if after 100 kilometers of hiking, I break down What or whatever, I just get tired of this? I think that the thing for the plan B um, and I, I, is that um, sometimes things don't happen. Mm -hmm. I think that's part of life. Uh, things don't happen the way you want, even though you have, you know, maybe big goals and dreams that are big for you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and if you physically are taxed and can't complete it, or maybe tragedy happens back at home and you have to leave, then at that time it's not meant to be. But even if it's not meant to be at that time, it doesn't mean that it's over. It doesn't mean that you can't go back. Um, maybe it'll, maybe it'll not be when you want it to, but it'll happen when it is, I guess, in, in ways serendipity is supposed to happen. The way things have developed for us in the production of this documentary, things have happened to where there has been more clarity um, that I'm glad I've gone through in, in doing this project. Uh, then, um, I, I mean, I was a complete mess during the war. But don't don't hate yourself. Don't get beat up uh, if you have to quit because of your leg or if something is pulling you back home. It's there will always there's always a future. You have to have hope, and um, you have to have hope, yeah. which is one of the points of the documentary. Uh, before we go, uh, Jonathan, uh, tell us about what surprised you about El Camino de Santiago. I don't know. So many things, right? If I if I'm trying to think, just about something specifically well, relevant. I mean, uh, were you? Was it tougher than you expected? Easier than you expected? I think it was tougher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was. You know, when we were talking about, I was a boy scout when I was a guy when I was a kid, but not enough. I mean, that's because I was telling you before. Mm -hmm. You have to think about these both sides. I was telling you. One thing is the your body, I mean, your health, your body, that you're gonna walk, it's gonna hurt. That's because you have to be prepared day by day, thinking about this. But the other side, the spiritual or internal side, I think that's the most important thing. And that's something that really amazed me because it was, uh, the place was so beautiful. Every single day you could see another, uh, another country, I mean, another place, another, uh, maybe you were seeing something different. So that was, it was really interesting for me. Every day I walked because, you know, we had to walk anyway, with the camera, whatever, we, we had to do it. So uh, it makes me alive that it was so beautiful to walk. I mean, the, the place, it was so beautiful. Uh, this views you had and all that, it was wonderful, but something, happened inside for me also, you know, and it was, I know I was uh, recording something or uh, there to do a job or whatever, but I couldn't stop thinking that it was really blessed being there for me. Uh, so I realized that I was there because of something, you know, and I started thinking about that moment. And like I was telling him, why am I here? I don't know, but I'm going to know afterwards, maybe. So when I went there, there was no expectations about that. Was it? I had to do my job. Was, it, That's was it. it hard when all of a sudden you're seeing, let's say, Mark, your cousin, you know, basically uh, having a breakdown and crying and being frustrated. And there you're trying to film him. And part of you probably wants to comfort him. And part of you wants to say, hey, you know. Or, but I mean, as a filmmaker, you just have to keep rolling the film. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was hard. It was hard because sometimes it was like, okay, man, I mean, it's not time to cry, man. I mean, talk to me. I mean, it's not time to cry. But then you think, like you're telling me, right? I mean, man, this is not a, a character. And that's something really clear that we talk afterwards. This is not a character. This is not... This is not Hollywood, right? I mean, this is real life. So that was really hard. I mean, I was like, okay, am I gonna record him or not? Mm -hmm. He's crying or he's really touched or he's really, I don't know if I'm gonna record or not. And, and then I said, I have to record. Well, of course, of we course. Are here. Oh, that's, those are the best parts of any film, especially then, documentary are the emotional parts. It's, it's, yes, it's that was really nice. And he was like, okay, man, you're gonna be okay. Everything's <laughs> gonna be okay. but. We have to record. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was really interesting and it was awesome. It was it was really good. You know, the one thing when he was mentioning about the emotional side of it, and I think I was going, I would have mentioned this also when it kind of comes to preparing yourself is people have now uh, divided the Camino into sections um, and they divided it into the the uh, the body 
the mind in the spirit, like the body, uh, is for your first leg. Uh, the mind ends up being the maseta, which can be a very long area to walk in. That's when you're on the carousel thinking of all the problems in your life. That's just the physical. Um, and then the spiritual being when you hit Galicia and you've gone, most people have gone through a certain amount of things and you start to connect. Um, I, I think what you what people think that they have to live up to that, and this is what I'm talking about, expectations. Uh, I was such a combination of all three of them through the whole process through even to the point to where, you know, the one thing I'll, I'll tell you about what happened is, you know, the priest, <laughs> even though I had um, chosen uh, Mushia as the place to let my dad's uh, ashes go, um, uh, the priest saw how messed up I was. Uh, I had gone to confession and, and he's like, you're not done yet. You, you, you need to keep going. And he, he mentioned Mushia first. So, I mean, he, Mushia... It, it, so you, Mushia so you were going to be going to Compostela, you were going to end it there, but then you've talked with uh, Reverend Philip Scott and he told you keep going? Uh, no. Uh, I, I can talk a little bit about, about uh, Father Philip here in a second, but uh, when you go into, into Compostela and you go into the cathedral, you know, there's like these like these confessional booths that are like open face, you know, the face of his confessionals are like, kind of like the Coney Island lady, you know, that's just face to face. And you have to, you're looking around going, oh my gosh, I need to talk about this stuff with people around. But um, I went ahead and, and, and knelt and went through the uh, the ritual and started talking with him. And he could see how, uh, how torn up I still was. Um, and he grabbed me by my hand and pulled me in and he, he said, your journey is not done here yet. You need to keep going and you need to uh, go to Musia. And, and, that's, then go to and that's the road, name of the film, The Road to Musia. By the way, I'm going to give a tip to both you and to people who are listening or watching to this um, when it comes to Kickstarter projects. One thing that's consistent is that they always deliver later, almost always, I think about 80% of projects, maybe 90% of projects deliver later. So even though you think you can get it done in April 2019 and have it released into the customer's hands by then, I would promise November. <laughs> Because, because, oh, no. and, and by the way, I know you hate, but just, it doesn't, you know, who's going to get mad at you, Mark or Jonathan for saying, Hey, we're three months early. Is anybody going to get angry at you? Nobody's going to get angry at you. Right. So you just say internally, you guys shoot for April and then you've got the November official. And if you get it to people's hands five months earlier, everybody's happy, but it's incredible. And this goes also for the people listening or watching this. When you participate yeah. in a Kickstarter project, whatever the organizers and the people who are doing the Kickstarter tell you, think this could be delayed another six months or another year and be okay with that. Because I see people who support projects and get furious because you promised me I was going to get this gadget in April and it's a year late and da, 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 da. So both sides need to kind of push back the time because it's such a common thing. Even with my project, when I did a Kickstarter, even I was a few months late and I felt terrible and I thought I was being conservative. Anyway, it's my tip to, to both of you. So, uh, yeah. How how um, do people how, how do people find out about the project and and the Kickstarter? If they just search for Road to Musia. Yeah, they can go to Facebook. They can query in uh, Road to Musia. They'll go to the uh, Facebook page, uh, Facebook and website, or how we're driving. Okay, and then uh, and we'll spell uh, it out. Uh, Musia is uh, M U X I A. Yeah. Yes, Road to Musia. The website is uh, MusiaFilm dot okay. com. Okay. And, yeah. and that has all the and, links uh, to, and that will have the links also to the Kickstarter, which will yeah. uh, last yes. for uh, as, as probably what, two months, I think you said? Yes, it's, it's going to be up for 60 days. Okay. Uh, I'd like okay. to hit the algorithm, and we've been building a buzz and building a community for the past couple of years. So we're hoping that it will be one of those projects that can go high on the algorithm and uh, can get funded in a week but we'll see yeah you know everybody shoots by the way you know, I mean, everybody swings for the i've read i read a lot about it i mean obviously you've picked your your 60 day date but i've read a lot of people saying that it's 30 days is the optimal that you actually raise more money because you create the sense of urgency and all this other stuff but 
uh, you guys yeah. go and you decide what you want to decide. But I, I remember 30 days was a long time. It felt like when I was when I was doing my Kickstarter, it was like, wow, this is taking, you know, it's going forever. And 60 days is a real marathon. So and the yes. question is, is whether you'll be able to raise more or less. You might raise the same amount if you just push it all for 30 days anyway. But that's just me giving random advice. Thank you. Yeah, we'll okay. take it. We'll, we'll take it. Yeah. Now you, you have us thinking yeah. on our side. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know, you mentioned one person, um, and I, it's something I do want to explain about the documentary. Uh, you mentioned uh, Father Philip Scott. Uh, he is a Peruvian-born priest that was uh, raised in Baltimore, uh, Maryland, and um, a, a lot of people within the community um, have wondered: Is this going to be a religious film? Because they see this. You know, this gentleman, this friar who looks like a 13th century monk, you know, with his big beard and whatnot in, in, in some of the uh, clips that we have online. Um, you know, my Catholicism is my experience. Uh, I, I struggle every day. You know, when people say they're Catholic, they expect them to be perfect. I struggle every day, man. Um, and I think that I've known the guy for, uh, for close to 25 years. And he uh, chose the priesthood over being a graphic designer. So we have the creativity and the backgrounds of design and things like that that were in common. Uh, very earthy guy, a uh, very uh, upfront guy. But for me, it has been his dialogue that has helped me through uh, a number of my processes, plus my own expo exploration on how to deal with uh, the, the things that we're dealing with, with when it comes to generational wounds. Um, it is not a Catholic film. Uh, it hits uh, nobody's gone. It, it is about a, an internal journey and a generational journey, my generational journey, because a lot of movies will talk about the Camino as the present. But I think where I'm trying to help myself and hopefully in, in, in some way help others is talking about something deeper that causes people to get there and say, yeah, to where I was so wrong, confused going through this, they can maybe have some time ahead of time to figure out a few things for themselves before they do that walk. Because I think their walk will be much more relevant for them if they do that, <laughs> instead of ending up there as a basket case, kind of like I did, and, and, and going through everything. <laughs> so, yeah. Good yeah. advice. Okay, well, it's been a pleasure talking with both of you. Um, and I wish you the best for your uh, launching of the Kickstarter project and for uh, journeys beyond that. <laughs>